King, the most unexpected thing about you to me is that for a long time you've been a national leader of your people. You're one of the most influential figures, I suppose, in the United States, and yet you're only 32 years old. Now, did you have any special training for this kind of leadership when you were a boy? No, I really didn't. I had no idea that I would be catapulted into a position of leadership in the civil rights struggle in the United States. I uh, went through the discipline of uh, early elementary school education and then high school and college and theological training, but never did I realize that I would be in a situation where I would be a leader in what is now known as the civil rights struggle of the United States. Uh, is your father, who's also a Baptist pastor, as I know, is he a social reformer as well as a minister, or is, or, or is he less interested in this side of it? Well, he's quite interested, actually. He has had an actual inter uh, interest in civil rights across the years. Uh, he is a pastor of a large church in Atlanta, Georgia. Incidentally, I'm co-pastor of the church. And uh, he has had a strong interest in civil rights. He has been president of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Atlanta. And uh, he always stood out in social reform. Do you think he saw that you would be a leader? And do you think he did, in fact, bring you up in some special way to face these responsibilities? Well, I think he certainly realized uh, the need for this. And... Uh, after I decided to enter the ministry, uh, he constantly stressed the need for leadership, and I'm sure that he hoped that I would stand out uh, in this area. Whether he realized uh, that I would do it or not is something else, but he certainly hoped for this. What sort of home did you have as a child? Was it a strict home, for instance? Well, I guess it was a relatively strict uh, coming up in in a minister's home, uh, I faced uh, the discipline that you would face in the very uh, fervent religious background. However, uh, I don't think it was over strict to the point that uh, I developed any personality conflict, uh, conflicts as a result of my early childhood, but uh, it was strict enough, and uh, I think it was strict enough for me to develop certain disciplinary principles as I came up. Were you a quick starter at your lessons? Yes, I, I would say generally I was. Uh, interestingly enough, I didn't uh, start out with an interest to enter the ministry. Uh, at first, uh, after finishing high school, I was interested in going into law and also medicine uh, at one point. And uh, all along, I received uh, fairly good grades. Uh, but finally, I decided to enter the ministry and then went on to theological school. Well, now, when you were still a small boy, before those decisions came along, were you conscious of color discrimination in your own life? Yes, I became conscious of color discrimination at a relatively early age. Uh, I think the first time was uh, when I was about six years old. Uh, I had some friends who lived, well, they didn't live in front of us, but uh, their parents had a store, two white boys, and they were my inseparable playmates for uh, the early years of my life. And I remember when I was about six, uh, something started happening. When I went over to play with them, uh, they always made excuses. They could not play. They were busy. And uh, finally, I went to my mother with this problem, and uh, she tried to explain to me in the best way she could uh, explain to a child six years old. And this was really the first time that I became aware of the racial differences, or rather really the racial problem. Uh, she made it clear to me that uh, this, had, uh, this system had a long history, uh, dating back to the time of slavery. She tried to explain the meaning of the system of segregation. Uh, but the thing I will always remember is that uh, in the midst of her explanation, uh, she always said to me, you must never feel that you are less than anybody else. You must always feel that you are somebody 
and you must feel that you are as good as anybody else. And of course, this came up with me in spite of the fact that uh, I still confronted the system of segregation every day. Was that a, a, a violent conflict in your life? If you really believed your mother and yet the system around you suggested that this wasn't true, it must have set up some sort of strain. Yes, I think so. I, as I look back over those early days, uh, I did have something of an inattention. On the one hand, my mother uh, taught me that I should feel a sense of somebodiness. On the other hand, uh, I had to go out and face a system uh, which uh, stared me in the face every day saying, you are less than, you are not equal to. So this was a real tension within. Now, out of your own personal experience, the only example you've given me so far is one family where the mother didn't too much care to have you play with her children. What were you really prevented from doing as a child that a white child might have done? Well, in my uh, days in Atlanta as a child, there was a pretty strict system of segregation. Uh, for instance, I could not use uh, the swimming pool so that uh, for a long, long time I could not go in swimming until uh, the YMCA was built, a Negro YMCA, and they had a swimming pool there. But certainly a Negro child in Atlanta could not go to any public park. Uh, I could not uh, go to the so-called white schools. There were separate schools. And I attended a high school in Atlanta, which was the only high school for Negroes in the city. Uh, and this was a real problem because in Atlanta there are more than 200,000 Negroes. In many of the stores downtown, to take another ex example, uh, I could not go to a lunch counter uh, to buy a hamburger, a cup of coffee, or something like that. Uh, I could not attend any of the theaters. Only uh, there were one or two Negro theaters. Uh, they were very small, but uh, they did not get the main pictures. If they got them, they were two years late or three years late. So that uh, by and large, there was a very strict system of segregation, and uh, there was nothing called racial integration at that time in Atlanta. Now, that's a description of the system. Was anybody actually cruel to you or violent to you because you were colored? Yes, uh, we did confront some of those problems. Uh, I remember as a child seeing uh, problems of police brutality, and uh, this was mainly aimed at Negro children and uh, Negro adults. Uh, I can remember also uh, the organization that is known as the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, this is an organization that stands on white supremacy and uh, an organization that in those days even uh, used violent methods uh, to preserve segregation and to keep the Negro in his place, so to speak. Now, I can remember seeing the Klan actually beat uh, Negroes on some of the streets uh, in Atlanta. But nobody ever beat you personally? No, I never, I did have one experience, uh, which was a relatively minor experience, but it still uh, lived with me a good deal. When I was uh, about eight years old, I was in one of the downtown stores of Atlanta, and uh, all of a sudden, someone slapped me, and the only thing I heard was somebody saying, uh, you are that nigger that stepped on my foot. And uh, it turned out to be a white lady. And, uh, of course, I didn't retaliate at any point. I finally went and told my mother what had happened, and she was very upset about it. But uh, at that time, uh, the lady who slapped me had gone, and uh, uh, my mother and I left the store almost immediately. Can you remember at this distance of time uh, why you didn't uh, respond in any violent way? Was it that you'd already thought of nonviolence, or was it that you just didn't dare as a Negro to, to take any strong action against a white? Well, I think probably it was a combination of two things. I hadn't thought of nonviolence at that early age as a, as a system of thought, uh, as a practical technique. Uh, I think uh, a great part of it was that uh, uh, I just uh, didn't think I wouldn't dare uh, retaliate uh, 
uh, hit back when a white person was involved. And uh, I think some of it was a part of my uh, native structure, so to speak, and that is that uh, I have never been one to hit back too much. Well, now, that's all, what, 20 years or so ago, I suppose. Yes. But how bad is the complaint today? After all, the United States has changed a lot. Uh, the Negroes' rights are protected under the law. What exactly, how much has this system changed between then and now? Well, it has changed a good deal. Uh, it is far from what it ought to be, but uh, I can see many, many changes that have taken place over the last few years. For instance, in the same Atlanta, Georgia, which is uh, one of the largest cities in the South, uh, there are some Negro students in formerly all white schools. Some of the parks uh, are integrated, some of the public parks. Just a few weeks ago, uh, about 177 lunch counters uh, were open to Negroes on a thoroughly integrated basis. Uh, I think uh, I could say also that court injustice is uh, not as glaring a reality today as it was uh, 10 years ago. Police brutality has uh, diminished a great deal. So that uh, in Atlanta alone there are many changes and uh, when I look over the total situation I can say the same thing. Uh, for instance, when the United States Supreme Court uh, rendered uh, the decision uh, declaring segregated schools unconstitutional in 1954. Uh, Seventeen states and the District of Columbia practice segregation in the public schools. Uh, but today, all, uh, I would say most of these states have made some move toward integration. Only three states are holding out, namely the states of... Uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. Yes. So that uh, there has been a great change uh, since, say, 1950 or 1945. Now, I can't help following you up at one point there. You said, I think I'm quoting you more or less verbally correctly, you said that denial of justice was less glaring than it used to be and that police brutality had, I think your words were, somewhat diminished. Now, it follows from that that you're not content that the Negro gets justice in the United States as things are at present, and you're not certain that the police do not victimize him. Well, yes, uh, uh, I think uh, we have moved on a great deal, but we still face token integration. By token integration, I mean a few Negroes getting uh, justice in a particular situation, but the vast majority still confronting problems of uh, economic insecurity uh, and social isolation. So that while we have moved on, uh, we only have token integration. And the problem now is to move from, from token integration to uh, overall integration, where it... Uh, involves more than just a few students in a school, more than just a few lunch counters open, uh, more than uh, gaining justice in the courts in a few situations, but in every situation. You spoke a moment ago about having been thrust forward into this position of leadership. How exactly did it happen? Why are you at 32 virtually the leader of the Negroes in the United States? Well, I started out as a pastor in Montgomery, Alabama, which uh, uh, is a state that adjoins the state of Georgia. Uh, after I finished my graduate work in Boston, I returned to Montgomery to pastor a church. After I had been in Montgomery about a year, uh, we had the problem there of uh, facing many indignities and injustices on the city buses. Uh, Negroes were treated in a very discourteous manner. The bus drivers usually talked to Negro passengers in a very inhuman way. Uh, not only that, uh, if one had visited Montgomery, Alabama prior to 1955, December of 1955, uh, he would have seen Negro passengers actually standing over empty seats. 
Uh, this was because uh, the first ten seats were reserved for whites only. And even uh, if Negro passengers uh, packed the buses and the other seats and uh, uh, there were no more seats left other than these seats reserved for whites only, Negro passengers could not sit there. So they had to stand over these seats even if a white passenger was not on the bus. Not only that, there were times when Negro passengers got on the buses at the front and put the fare in the box and then they had to get off the bus and board by the the rear entrance. These were some of the conditions that existed. And uh, on the 5th of December uh, in 1955, a Negro woman was arrested, a Mrs. Rosa Parks, for refusing to give up her seat for a boarding white male passenger. Pretty soon after she was arrested, the word got around the Montgomery community uh, and there was a, a spontaneous reaction. Uh, I think I could say safely that uh, more than 99% of the Negro people of Montgomery rose up with a bit of uh, indignation, a righteous indignation, I would say. And this uh, led uh, to the bus boycott. The Negro citizens decided not to ride the buses until these conditions were changed. They asked me to serve as a spokesman and the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And from this time, I found myself in uh, a leadership position in the civil rights struggle. And the bus boycott was, of course, a startling success under your leadership. Yes, uh, we struggled for 381 days, but at the end of that, we returned to thoroughly integrated buses, and they are integrated today in Montgomery. Now, what does this position of leadership cost you in personal terms? I mean, do you, are, are you threatened? Do you get anonymous letters? You have had violence, I think, shown to you more than once. Tell us a little what is involved in all that. Yes, uh, I have uh, been threatened many, many times. Uh, there was a time that we received as many as 30 and 40 threatening calls a day. And, of course, uh, I received numerous uh, threatening letters. Uh, my secretary has come to the point now that she doesn't show me uh, most of these letters, but occasionally I come across them. Uh, within the last few days, I remember receiving uh, a threatening letter. And uh, they say such things as uh, this... Uh, you are, you are causing too much trouble in this town, and if you aren't out within 10 days, you and your family will be killed. Now, in Montgomery, our home was bombed twice, and uh, I guess uh, these were the most uh, severe instances of violence that we confronted. Uh, but even today, we still confront uh, threats uh, through telephone calls and, and through the mail. Do you, have you found that the police have been diligent in protecting you, as diligent as they would be with a white leader? Well, in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, they were not. Uh, certainly, we got no protection from uh, the law enforcement agencies. Uh, in fact, one of the big problems that we confront in some situations in the South is that... Uh, Many of the mobs and the hoodlums are aided and abetted by uh, some of the policemen. But I must say that uh, this is a little different in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, when we have received threats, uh, when we have had crosses burned on our lawn by the Ku Klux Klan, uh, the policemen have been very diligent in attempting to protect us, so that uh, uh, situations do vary even in the Deep South. You were once the victim of, of an actual assassination attempt, were you not? Yes. What happened? Well, this was uh, in Harlem. Uh, it turned out to be a diminished uh, Negro woman, and she happens to be in an institution even at this hour for the criminally insane. I was autographing books in a bookstore in, in Harlem in New York City, and uh, this was a book, uh, Stride Toward Freedom, that I wrote a few years ago. And uh, she came in. I was writing, and uh, I heard someone say, Are you Reverend King? And I didn't hardly look up. I just said yes. And by that time, uh, she leaned over and stabbed me. And, of course, it was a near-fatal stabbing. Uh, I was in the hospital for several weeks as a result of this. 
But this was not actually, I mean, since the woman was demented, this was not strictly relevant to your campaign. No, I, I don't think uh, it uh, could be included in uh, events that took place as a result, uh, uh, totally as a result of uh, my work in the civil rights area. And yet I don't think it can be totally divorced because if I hadn't been involved in this, uh, she wouldn't have even known me. So that in some way it was connected, but not totally. Have you during this period, which must have been one of very great strain for you, have you felt frightened and even very lonely in your position of leadership? Yes, at times. I think uh, honesty impels me to admit that there have been those times that I actually confronted fear. Uh, I don't think anyone in a situation like this can go through it without confronting moments of real fear. But uh, I have always had something that uh, gave me an inner sense of assurance and an inner sense of security in, in the final analysis, even in the moments of loneliness. Uh, something ultimately came to remind me that, that in this struggle, because it is basically right, because it is a thrust forward to achieve something not just for Negro people, but something that will save the whole of mankind. Uh, and when I have come to see these things, uh, I always felt a, a sense of cosmic companionship so that the loneliness and the fear have faded away because of a greater uh, feeling of security because of commitment to a moral ideal. Does that carry you as far as feeling total confidence in yourself? For instance, for better or worse, you've become the symbol now of Negro emancipation in the southern states. Now, are you an adequate symbol? Do you feel that you're adequate? Well, again, I must confess that uh, there are those moments when I feel a sense of inadequacy as a symbol. Uh, it is never easy for, for one to accept the role of uh, symbolism without going through constant moments of self-examination. And uh, I must confess that there are moments when I begin to wonder uh, whether I am adequate or whether, whether I'm able to, to face all of the challenges and even the responsibilities uh, of this particular position. Have you always found that you've been able to keep your wife and children with you, or have you ever felt it necessary to send them away for safety? There have been times that uh, I have had to send them away for safety, particularly when we were in the state of Alabama. Uh, but my wife happens to be one of those very strong persons and one who is very concerned about this whole matter and very dedicated. And I can remember moments when I sent her away for safety. Uh, I would look up a few days later and she was back home because she wanted to be there. Dr. King, clearly you're making progress in this. Now, could you make more progress if you, your demonstrations were based on more direct action, on strikes, for instance, on a more direct economic threat in the way that some of the uh, African people struggling for independence have tried to shape their destinies? Well, I do feel that uh, non-violent direct action uh, is, uh, is a most powerful approach in uh, seeking to bring about racial justice. Now, to a degree, we have, uh, we have moved in this area. The, the Montgomery bus boycott was a limited move in this area. Uh, the sit-ins that have uh, engulfed the whole South over the last few months would be another move in this uh, direction. This is nonviolent direct action. Uh, also, the freedom rides. Uh, I think all of these things are certainly serving to speed up the process. And I think the more we delve uh, deeper into these particular areas, uh, the more we will be able to bring about uh, at least a speedier solution to the problem. Some of your critics do say that you lack fire. I've heard that said about you, that uh, you're not really keen on challenging except on the margins of this problem. Now, I expect that's unfair, but I'd like to hear your answer to it. Well, I don't know if I lack fire. Uh, I do feel that at times I... 
I am rather soft and maybe a little gentle, but uh, on the other hand, I have uh, strongly advocated uh, direct action. Uh, I have made it clear that I believe this is uh, one of the most potent weapons available to oppress people for, in their struggle for freedom uh, and human dignity. So that uh, uh, I don't consider this a marginal approach. I consider this a, as an approach going to uh, the very depths. I have uh, participated in sit-ins myself. I have been arrested as a result of my participating in sit-ins with the students at lunch counters. Uh, I served as one of the coordinators of the Freedom Rides. So that uh, I don't think uh, it is true to say that uh, I am not uh, in accord with these particular methods. I believe in them and I have advocated them and participated in them. I understand exactly why you believe in nonviolence, but have you found it easy to persuade your followers that nonviolence is really the best method? I mean, there must be a great temptation to take a poke back at a white man who hits you. That is true that uh, <clears throat> it is difficult at times to uh, convince people that this is the best way. Uh, and I guess it is difficult for all of us uh, not to retaliate. But on the whole, I have been amazed at the uh, tremendous uh, response that we have gained uh, when we have called for nonviolent action. Uh, I, I look back over Montgomery and think of the fact that for all of these days, 381 days, uh, more than 99 and 9 tenths percent of the Negro uh, citizens participated in the boycott. They confronted uh, harassing experiences. They confronted physical violence. And never did they retaliate with a single act of physical violence. And uh, the same is true of the student sit-in movement, which included thousands of students. Uh, not a single, uh, well, I would say very few, uh, retaliated with physical violence so that uh, even though it is difficult I think we have been able to get this method over uh, in a most significant way. Dr. King apart from the business of discrimination are you a radical in other causes? Do you follow the other great radical political causes in the world or not? Well I'm not sure uh, what cause you... Are you speaking... concerned for instance with with let's say the the abolishing of nuclear weapons? Well, Oh, yes. I have uh, worked very closely uh, with uh, this uh, particular approach. I have worked uh, with uh, an organization for sane nuclear policy in the United States, uh, and I am a strong believer in disarmament and suspension of nuclear tests and uh, some methods uh, being used to arouse the conscience of mankind on this most important issue. As I've said so often, uh, I don't think the choice is any longer between violence and nonviolence in a day when guided ballistic missiles are carving highways of death uh, through the stratosphere. I think now it is a choice between nonviolence and non-existence, so that I have strongly endorsed uh, organizations that are fighting or struggling in a creative, nonviolent way to arouse the conscience of mankind on this issue. Well, now, let me put to you a, a last question. You could live and work in many parts of the world where you'd be discriminated against much less than you are in the United States. You are, I suspect, a patriotic American citizen, and you probably don't propose to live anywhere but the United States. Now, will you tell me why? Well, I can only say that uh, the United States is home for me. I was uh, born there, and uh, in spite of its shortcomings, uh, naturally there are things in the United States that I love and people that I love. Uh, I think we have uh, a great tradition, ideally. The democratic creed is a marvelous one. And uh, my work is simply an attempt to say to America, that uh, you have a marvelous ideal and uh, you should live up to it. And so when the students sit down at lunch counters and I have decided to join with them, uh, I felt that we were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream 
and certainly the best uh, in the dream of all mankind for peace and brotherhood. So I live there with the feeling uh, that we are moving in the right direction and uh, with the feeling that uh, this problem can be solved in the United States if enough people give themselves to it, if they devote their lives to breaking down all of the barriers that separate men from men on the basis of race or color.